First of all, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being here tonight. And to you guys, congratulations. I am a huge, huge fan of the time travel genre. So this is my kind of film. You know what I mean? Any, I'm, I'm all in. But before we get into this, I have a few individual questions. Uh, Ned, I'm going to start with you. Um, you made a film that you can watch multiple ways. You can watch, uh, I'm talking about the disappearance of Eleanor Rigby. You can either watch it as them or... So for people that aren't familiar with it, can you sort of explain what you did with the film and what is the version you want people watching first if they've never seen it? Uh, yeah, I made a movie in 2012 um, that basically looks at both sides of a relationship from the husband's side, which is uh, James McAvoy, and then the wife's side, which is Jessica Chastain, and essentially... That was the way that we presented at the Toronto Film Festival and how it should be seen. And then when it was acquired by the Weinstein Company, um, <laughs> it was merged into a third film called Them to be more palatable for audiences, which I think took away from some of the concept. But yeah, I, I think, uh, again, dealing with loss and relationships and love and uh, themes I kind of keep coming back to, I guess. Sure. So the, the the best way to watch it is not the combined version. From just in terms of the, the concept and the way I made it, yes, for sure. Just an individual question for you. Uh, you've been involved in a number of projects, but I'm curious, when did you realize that Beef was being watched by, like, everyone? <laughs> I realized that when I was at a restaurant and um, a random person came up to me while I was eating dinner and said, do you want some beef with that? <laughs> And I said, no, I'm eating chicken, but thank you so much. Um, and uh, that was the moment where I was like, oh, people are watching the show. Uh, Austin, I have an individual for you. Um, a lot of people don't realize you got your start. If I could be wrong, your first television appearance was on Atlanta playing the black Justin Bieber. And I'm just curious, A, it, I mean, when did you realize oh shit, a lot of people are watching this show, and B, how did you get your break on Atlanta? Well, the first time that I realized, oh my God, this is big, was I was in Paris at Charles de Gaulle, and there were two kids that were about to get on my flight, and they were like, oh my God, it's Black Justin Bieber. <laughs> and I was like, nah, I'm in Paris, and they talking about Black Justin Bieber. So that was where I was like, okay, this is big. And then, um, I went to NYU. Shout out to anybody that went to NYU. A hey, shout out NYU. A, hey. um, and I was freelance, like auditioning with like a, an agency in New York. And between gen eds and classes, I would audition. And then like a month later, I got a call in the middle of one of my gen ed psychology classes, and they were like, "You pack your bags. You're going home." And I was like, "Wait, are you serious?" And I was a sophomore, so a. Hey. You know, it was it was a good time, and that was my break. Yeah. Jumping into why I get to talk to you guys today, uh, what is it about the time travel genre that resonates with so many people, a la like me? And for each of you, uh, do you have a favorite time travel movie, not including your own? You want to start? Oh well. <laughs> um, I don't know about movie. I'll say show. And I don't even know if this counts, but Heroes, um, yeah, Heroes was like just, it was the first time that I ever actually sat down and watched something week to week to week and like made sure that I was at the TV. Now it's like more streaming and like, you know, but that was absolutely the first time that time travel was like, okay, this is it. I th love the movie Click. Um, <laughs> is that time travel? That is, right? He's like going back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Adam Sandler is amazing. And that scene with his parents always makes me cry. So I love that movie. I think time travel movies and shows are so, um, they connect to us, I think, because I think we all like think about things in our past that we wish we could maybe tweak or change and maybe even going into the future and what our futures would look like. So I think these are things that we're always thinking about. So uh, I think that's probably why it resonates with so many of us. <laughs> right, Ned? <laughs> Get ready for the generation gap, because like... <laughs> 
I uh, I went to see Back to the Future like ten times the summer it came out. Uh, I'm obsessed with that movie and always have been and always will be. So that was like one of my. That's my time travel touchstone, I think, for sure. Um, so a little generic, but what was it about this story that said, I want to make this? Um, the sort of like, I guess, well, there are a few reasons. One, I'm just so, uh, I'm really transported by music in so many ways. Like uh, just living in Los Angeles and being in your car, the amount of music that I listen to in my car, I listen to music getting here tonight, you know, I think music is such a huge part of the fabric of my life and has always really emotionally resonated with me and takes me so clearly back to so many moments in my life. So that was one concept I was playing with, but I read this book in 2008 by Oliver Sacks called Musicophilia, which is about uh, how music and the brain interact. And one of the things he talks about is like, uh, musical hallucinations or synesthesia, which is like, you know, when a certain song can create these kind of hallucinations in your brain. Um, so I, I sort of read that and thought it was pretty interesting at that time and started to conceive the idea for the movie. From when you started writing to what people watch tonight, uh, how much, what were the big changes along the way in terms of what you originally envisioned versus, you know, the finished film? I think from the conceit, it was pretty similar. Uh, script changed so drastically. I wrote a draft in like 2009 that then I put on a shelf because I went to make other movies and then write movies for other people. And then during COVID, uh, I took it off the shelf and rewrote the lead character as a woman um, and kind of reconceived some of the music that was resonating with me now there was one song that stayed from 2008 which is the opening song by the the which is this is the day but everything else kind of was new music that was kind of resonating in my life more currently so uh for the stars of the film for each of you what was it like what was it about this project that said uh oh, i'm really excited to be a part of this well, um, first of all, it was one of the only script, honestly, one of two scripts that entire year that I was, I read it and then I clicked and clicked and clicked and all of a sudden it was over. And it's just so interesting and different and cool. And I'm a, I'm a musician myself and like music is such a big part of life and of storytelling. And I thought that it was really interesting how you can narrate um, the grief journey with music in the way that this movie has done. And I mean, even just like with your friend groups and how um, it can bring you back to, to places in the sci-fi elements of uh, what was going on as well. Like it was just, Kiss me. It was A1. I loved it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Crute. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no one in the theater is getting this. I'm, I'll drop it there. I'm sorry. Uh, I think for me, um, I was actually going through the process of grieving uh, someone I, I knew and loved very much. And this, the script sort of came at this very timely uh place in my life and I connected very strongly and viscerally to the script and I met Ned uh, over Zoom and I just fell in love with Ned and um, kind of his whole explorations of grief and music and all of these things and I just wanted to do this project with him and um, yeah that's that's how I got involved. I'm, I'm a follow up for you guys. Um, how nervous do you get before the first night of filming something? Are you in your head, especially like a, like a lot, or can you sort of you know relax and be like, whatever happens, happens? I mean, for me, it's like whatever happens, happens. I mean, <laughs> once you get it, you got it, and you memorize it, and then you show up and get a little crafty, and then it's time to go. I mean. <laughs> That's, that's how I approach it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> and that shows because you were so confident <laughs> on set. Um, I, I was a nervous wreck. Um, fortunately, though, we did have rehearsal beforehand. So we got to know each other and we had dinner and we felt very comfortable. So that had already been established. But even so, I think the first day you get on any set, it's it's nerve wracking for me. One of the things, this music plays a huge, huge part of this film. And one of the things is you have to find songs that work for the material, but also songs that you can afford. So talk a little bit about like finding that balance and finding songs that meet both criteria. Yeah, I mean, I worked really closely with the music supervisor, Mary Ramos, who's incredible. Uh, she did all of Tarantino's movies from Kill Bill on, and she's just pretty spectacular in terms of kind of guiding you with what you can get away with and what we were working with in terms of our music budget. Um, but I think if you look or listen closely, a, a lot of the songs are lyrically giving you the subtext of the story. So this is the day or loud places or, uh, Leon Haywood, um, don't push it, don't force it. All of these songs are actually kind of helping tell the story. And we were pretty purposeful in finding tracks that had lyrics that were basically talking about what each scene was about when you were in those scenes too. So um, that was a very kind of conscious uh, process that we had in terms of uh, choosing those things. And then, you know, you have your heartbreak because there are a few songs I was like, oh, I want a Prince song. And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like not gonna happen so I was like okay fine you know but um I do feel really lucky with what we did get and a lot of it was you know a wish list and you know we were sharing a lot of playlists before the movie in pre-production you know making character playlists for each of these guys and the whole team and kind of a lot of music going back and forth even on Saturday nights they would come over to my house for dinner and we'd sing karaoke and I can tell you that Austin has the voice of an angel. So, like, his Frank Ocean is insane. It's, like, second to none, so. I mean, that that is a setup. <laughs> <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I am curious, a lot of times films will either explain the time travel or uh, show the character. You you have an interesting choice in this where you are starting the film where she's already experiencing it and is in the middle of this journey. Talk a little bit about um, why you wanted to do that and was there ever a producer or somebody saying, hey, we need more explanation or we need this? I, I've always been one of those people that I kind of like to start movies in media res and kind of unpeel the onion like as you go and sort of reveal things uh, as the movie moves forward so you're not shoving information or expository information or you're, you're showing and not telling is more what I'm interested in as a filmmaker and some people can be frustrated by that but I think in this case it was more about you know, showing what she was going through through her behavior and then obviously having the David character and the Morris character kind of help us explain or understand what's going on with her in reality. For all three of you, uh, you see the shooting schedule. Uh, what day do you have circled in terms of I cannot wait to film this? And what day is circled in terms of how the F are we going to film this? <laughs> I mean, my... Loving filming it was the bears in space. That was the funnest like thing ever. It was the party scene where everybody was there and you guys were on a date. Um, and it was just really, really fun. Um, I don't, for me, um, for my role, uh, I don't think that I ever had a, a moment where I was like, oh, how are we gonna do this? Except for maybe uh, when I was carrying that speaker and I was like, I better not drop this. <laughs> I was like, I better not drop this. It was good. All of the equipment and the music and the analog equipment that was in the movie is like 100% real and functional and very well thought out and vintage and so cool. And I honestly learned so much. Um, from uh, Ned and Daniel, Daniel? Daniel and Daniel that it just blew my mind honestly um but yeah that that is my answer 
I would say um, the scene that I was most terrified about, and I think Lucy would agree with me, was the karaoke scene. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we were terrified of doing that. Uh, we didn't really practice it because we didn't want to practice it. So, you know, what you see on screen is really kind of our first time really doing that. And uh, there wasn't a lot of acting involved there. It was us being incredibly embarrassed and terrified. And that song is so hard to sing. So hard. I don't know why you made us do that song. To, tor to torture you, <laughs> like to torture you for sure. And I would say maybe my favorite, one of my favorite scenes to film was the scene on the, the Sears building where we are doing the silent disco. I mean, it, what you see in the movie is exactly what it was like. It was this perfect LA night and you could see all of downtown and we were on this rooftop and we all had these light up um, headphones on and just felt so special and it was it was a lovely evening evening um there were a few i mean that that sh that day or the, those days of shooting on the sears uh building were incredible but it was also like getting to the set was a horror movie like the, it's an abandoned building like it just like they lit it with like these like lanterns at night and it was like super dusty and you thought like someone was going to jump out of nowhere. Like you didn't know who was, it was the wildest thing. And then one of the elevators broke and like we all had to share this like old freight elevator. So that was kind of a nightmare. Um, and then we had to shoot at my house for a week to save money. I gave my house up for a week, uh, so I could get that location, the Sears building, and my wife was not happy. <laughs> so that was the most dangerous, kind of insane thing that I did on the movie, uh, for sure. One of the other things you did, which is very ambitious, is you did all location filming in LA, and I think you had like 36 locations, something crazy. At what point did your line producer or someone pull you aside and say, what the F are you doing? Uh, from the beginning. like. <laughs> But I think to, to this movie's a love letter to Los Angeles. Like, f f like I think I love the city so much. I'm from New York, but my mom moved out here when I was like 12 years old, so I feel a bit schizophrenic. Um, but I've lived here for a long time, and I love the city so much. So I really wanted to not cheat it in any way. And I was like, well, if if I can shoot in my house for a week, are you cool that I? can have all these other locations and and they were cool with it so i mean it was definitely ambitious we were definitely pissing people off with the amount of trucks that we had and the amount of neighborhoods that we were annoying um but uh we did get some amazing locations and i think it, i got to shoot the city the way i wanted uh to see it so uh for all three of you you did as i mentioned and you've touched on you shot all over la what is a location or a place you got to film at that most people don't know about besides the Sears building that you would say to people who live in LA, you got to scope this out? Oh, easy. A civil coffee. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, my brother lives in Highland Park with his family, so I've been to civil so many times and it was surreal to film in a place that I've been to and I love. Great coffee, would highly recommend if you're ever out there. I am a born and bred Atlantan. <laughs> I've been in LA since 2019, and I'm still getting to know the areas, the neighborhoods, and everything like that. Where did we film the Bears in Space? Jin Ling Wei in Chinatown. So Chinatown. That whole area in Chinatown, incredible. Mm. Um, and that is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, those were, those were all great. I, th I think, uh, I think the beach day was really special for me because we weren't sure we were supposed to, I'd scripted the beach scene at night with like bioluminescence and everybody was like, no, like <laughs> VFX. No, like the DP was like, everything's going to just be so dark. So we're like, he's like, why don't we shoot at sunset and shoot this during the day? And um, that beach, which is, uh, Cabrillo beach over in like, uh, near Long Beach, um, or like sort of San Pedro, um, is, uh, it films really beautifully. Um, and it's one of the best shooting beaches I think you can find in LA cause it's very like secluded and, um, I don't know. That was a, that was a, that was a special one for me and it worked out in a really nice way. 
Uh, so I'm fascinated by the editing process. Anyone who's been to any Collider screening knows this next question. Um, how, who did you show the film to in the in the rough stages for honest feedback? And what did you hear from them that impacted the finished film? Um, so I, I'm, I did a director's cut with the editor and we screened very early uh, for about like 30 close friends who I asked to be completely brutal on the movie. And they were like, they were tough. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it was just finding, um, finding like, I think the right group of strangers, friends, collaborators who were willing enough to, to really beat us up. And I think, uh, one thing that I think really helped was, um, falling in love with the the Max and Harriet earlier like that scene of them that opens the movie where it's like the montage of their relationship wasn't there we kind of just like dropped into her life where she like wakes up goes to like goes back in time the first time and then goes to the library and we really didn't have the I think the understanding of what this relationship was to her so that was a creation that came from the editor, you know, the early screenings of this movie where people like, well, we want to fall in love with them a little bit more and a little earlier before we really like engage in the movie with them. So did you end up with a lot of deleted scenes? Um, no, not a lot of deleted scenes. I think we, we editorialized the beach scene, which as a filmmaker, I, sh I wanted, I sh it was a oneer, but it was like a five minute oneer. Um, and it, that whole scene was actually like them on the beach and it just followed them into the water and they had this whole conversation and kept going and going and going. And at some point the studio turned to me and was like, you're being super indulgent. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I am. So, um, and I really liked the shot, but we kind of cut it up and made it more elliptical and I think it works better for the movie itself. So I had to kill my darling there, but that happens. Uh, I definitely have to touch on, I think that. Uh, you are going to be on Hulu in a week. Mm -hmm. And one of the advantages you have is, uh, listen, it's hard to get people to watch certain things. There's a lot of competition. But we have to touch on the fact that one of your actors is now playing Superman. Yes. How effing happy are you when he got cast as Superman? I was really happy for him. He actually called me to ask. I, I, was, in the, uh, I was in the sound mix, and he called to tell me that he had been asked to test and he's like what do you think and i'm like one out of a you know 100 out of 100 times yes like you don't get this shot and he's such an extraordinary actor he's such an extraordinary human being i'm like so happy for him but if, i think we were all like thrilled for him because um he's such a great guy uh and such a great actor so um couldn't be happier for him and he's he's gonna show up to a screening in Atlanta, I think on Sunday, kind of uh, sneak in and surprise some people. So that'll be fun. Yeah, I think that, um, listen, it, it is, there's a lot of competition for eyeballs. And I do think that if you're a fan of Superman um, and you want to see his work, you know, hey, there's an example right here. Sure, sure. I mean, he's a great actor in everything he's in. So I think whether it's the Ty West movies or sure. the Ryan Murphy yeah. stuff he's done, but he's he's fantastic. So I, I lucked out with an extraordinary cast of, of actors, and I'm, I'm really lucky to have uh, worked with each of them. So Including Mr. Crute. Including Mr. Crute. We're going to keep going with Mr. Crute. I'm not, I'm not letting it. I'm, he's gonna, well, we're going to walk out of here. He's going to punch me in the face. No. But, you know. Uh, he's, he's too nice. I am curious, though. So talk a little bit about uh, the rules of time travel in the film. And what were the rules that you came up with? And how much were the rules impacted by the budget and what you could actually accomplish with the film? And y you know what I mean? Because each film plays it differently in the, in the genre. I think the limitation that we placed on it was it just was the course of a, of a song. Like you, she had the time, you know, allotted for the length of the song in order to go back. So it kind of created these limitations that I think worked for the film so we could play out a song or at least a piece of the song and, and show that experience that she had. And she had a limited amount of time. So there was a ticking clock on each of those times that she went back. Um, and then on top of that, it was just like, I think part of it is this big uh, metaphor or analogy for acceptance in a relationship. I think the moment where 
she places that note in the desk for David to find really is more about two people who understand each other and he accepts, you know, what she's going through in that moment. Um, and they really do kind of understand each other for the first time. So I was playing with, you know, this idea of, of what love actually is in terms of applying it through the lens of time travel, if that makes any sense whatsoever. No, it, it totally does. Uh, for your actors, I'm always curious about how an actor prepares for a role. Both of your roles are so radically different. And I'm curious for each of you, how early on before you stepped on set, were you like really thinking about the script, how you wanted to play it? And how much, I guess if you could just take me through for each of you, like how you get ready f for a role, specifically this one. Well, I mean, it was a few months before, um, like a good time before Ned, as he mentioned earlier, had a comprehensive playlist for each character. And I really went through and listened to I mean it was it was a lot of music um but it really set the tone for um the vibe and Morris's character is based on Larry Levin who studio 4 DJ studio 54 DJ and um did some research on him and I mean it's 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 kind of integral to the entire um musical heart of the movie that um, help me just to get my mind and my spirit into the world that was being created. And, uh, yeah, I would say that that was really the integral part of my preparation for the film. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would say uh, you, very similarly, um, we, we had these playlists that um, Ned and I would curate for David, which was really helpful. We also just had so many conversations before filming. We had the rehearsal process. I think my preparation changes a bit from project to project and role to role, but um, this one was really engaging in a lot of conversations. I think Lucy and I talked a lot about how we didn't want each of our characters to be sort of bogged down just by the grief and that it was important for us to find moments of levity and um, yeah, for me, I think that the thing that really resonated most, uh, the thing that kind of broke David open for me was like this idea that he's like in his head for most of the movie because of the grief of his parents, but Harriet's character sort of brings him back into his body in the present moment and, uh, just really wanted to focus on that throughout, throughout the filming process. We're just about out of time, but uh, Justin, I do have an individual question for you. There are some people in this theater and probably who are going to be watching this Q&A that have heard of a show called The Umbrella Academy. And um, I believe that the final season comes out later this year. Yeah, exactly, August. So I am curious, uh, what can you tease people about the final season and what is it like like playing the, you know what I mean? Like the role's coming to a close and it's been so important to so many people and I'm sure yourself, what does it mean to, you know what I mean? To inhabit, to play, you know, Ben again and uh, to let the character go. Yeah, we filmed uh, the final season last year, the first half of last year. Uh, it was incredibly emotional. Um, but we were just so thankful to have the opportunity to sort of close out the story. Uh, so many shows, unfortunately, get like prematurely canceled. But we knew going in this was going to be our final season. So our writers and our showrunner had the opportunity to wrap up all the storylines. And um, it was just uh, such uh, uh, an incredible opportunity for us to say goodbye to our characters, but also to our amazing crew in Toronto, our amazing directors and everyone that we've known throughout the four seasons. Um, in terms of what to expect, I'll probably uh, be killed if I say something. But um, I think I can tease, you know, there are a lot of questions that have been brewing throughout the seasons of the show. And I do think they they really do get answered in this final season. And I think there is a real sense of closure. So I'm excited for the fans who've been waiting for certain answers to, to get those. What, and what's interesting is I spoke to Gerard, uh, like maybe for the first season before it came out or really early on. And he told me that he had figured out like all seven graphic novels and he shared that information. So my guess is he shared 
some of that information that hopefully will be into the final, you know, added into the final season. Like, it's not like it was made up. He had it already figured out. I can neither confirm nor <laughs> deny that. <laughs> I'm saying that maybe perhaps he told me that and you can, you know, so just throwing that out there. Uh, anyway, listen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And thank you guys seriously for doing the Q&A. Thank you. And